So one of the questions that I get a lot is why do people deny science? More access to misinformation online casts more doubt on established science. What if the moon is a hologram? What if it's not real? Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that you have nowhere left to turn but some sort of flat earth model? I can do it all day long. As post-truth becomes a new normal. How can I identify misleading information? I know you guys know what a conspiracy theory is. You guys watch enough YouTube to know what that stuff is. It gets harder to separate scientific fact from personal belief. Is there not a national standard for science instruction in this country? No. As long as I've been a teacher, politics have been involved. And now, experts fear an anti-science movement could go mainstream. Who here believes in evolution? so much for everyone that has come up. So I really wanted to push this year the idea that there is something behind everything that is being shown to the world. And many more people are about to wake up because the truth is the truth. The truth is on our side. You can't stop it. This is not going to be stopped because the truth sets people free. This is the Flat Earth Conference, and uh, we're told that there are about 650 or so attendees, which makes us the largest yet. This is a community that's, that's gaining traction and gathering steam. Along this hallway, there are lots of little booths selling anything from hats and uh, clothing to books and DVDs. We encourage people to not take our word for it but instead do their own research and question everything. Mark Sargent emerged as one of the voices of the Flat Earth Movement, thanks to videos like these he posted on YouTube. The government is on the same page as the Flat Earth, but they can't admit it, even in confidence. We know the Earth isn't flat, they say, but it really is. Are you anti-science? No. No, I love science. I think it's great. I think that science has expanded its boundaries to where they do things for money and they cut corners for money. But I love science. How can you, how can you say you're not anti-science and yet question some of the most basic and trusted tenets of science that have been proven over, That's over just time? It. We, just, we question that proof. There's lots of things in science that have been disproven over the years. And this is a very, very big one. This is a very tough pill to swallow. You have mounds of evidence supporting mm. the fact, the science uh -huh. behind a spherical globe. Right. You have hunches, doubts, maybe selective evidence mm. suggesting that it's flat. Right. Apples and oranges, no? Yeah. Can I prove to you right now, well, obviously not you, but can I prove to anybody right now that the Earth is flat? No, I cannot. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that you have nowhere left to turn but some sort of flat Earth model? Oh yeah, I can do it all day long. And you, you would come back and say, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I go, yeah, it is. Every hour of every day in court, reasonable doubt is enough. Mm. And that's where most of these people start their journey. Would this conference, would the 650 people who are here, yeah. would that all be possible without YouTube? No. No. YouTube was the catalyst for most of this. YouTube, even though it's not considered formal programming, is the biggest television network in the world. I have two big reasons why man-made climate change is a crock of YouTube content creators can post videos on scientific subjects with virtually no vetting or restrictions. We saw some really strange geoengineering chemtrails being put up in the sky. Since its launch in 2005, YouTube has grown to 2 billion monthly active users and perfected personalization algorithms. 
Content that is consistent with users' clicking habits is promoted, which creates a feedback loop of misinformation. It makes you wonder, have we ever actually been to the moon? What if the moon is a hologram? What if it's not real? Who the f knows? Don't believe anything you see. So one of the questions that I get a lot, or that you even read a lot in newspapers or in magazines, is why do people deny science? One of the hypotheses is that, well, people used to trust science, but over time, we're starting to see a distrust in scientific evidence and scientific information. So, you know, doubt about evolution, doubt about climate change, and, and, and beliefs in flat Earth have existed long before you know, everyone was on, on YouTube and, and, and had the internet at their disposal. How much has YouTube and the internet complicated uh, science communication? The internet has offered the ability for people to discuss science, but at the same time, you've provided a platform that anybody can put their information out on there. And so if you can say, don't trust these scientists because they're funded by this group or because they're you know, liberal or because you, know, you can give a bunch of different reasons, then you start instead focusing on the information that fits your worldview. It's almost as if there's just an aversion to accepting rule by authority. Yes, so I'd say they definitely reject authorities, but in some ways it's, it's sort of a magnified version of something everybody else in the in, at least in the US, feels as well that we are individuals, that we have a right to our own views, and that we're capable of evaluating evidence and determining what's trustworthy and believable. The rise in pseudoscience on social media further complicates a long history of religious and political movements that lobby to have beliefs and ideology taught alongside science in schools. Okay, you've got to understand camouflage, you've got to understand mimicry, you've got to understand um, hibernation, migration. Those are all things that the animals do that help them be more successful. All right, questions at all? No. Moriah Graff teaches seventh grade science at a public middle school in Woodward, Oklahoma. So what you just described to a T is evolution, but you don't use that word. Yeah, change over time. I mean, I do. I mean, I, I will I will use it in the classroom, but we don't use it to the full extent of, like, we don't talk about change from, like, one species to the next. Uh -huh. um, you know, like, I, I believe in change within kinds, absolutely. The moth turned into a different moth. Um, you know, but that's my personal beliefs versus, you know, science beliefs. I mean, that right. as a teacher, I have to balance both. I'm going to teach my standards the way the state tells me to teach them, even uh -huh. though I might not necessarily agree with it. But in Oklahoma, I don't have to fight that as much since we are a lot more conservative state. Right. Uh, so who here, uh, who here believes in evolution? Who here believes in animal adaptations? And who here believes in creation? Oklahoma is one of 30 states that did not fully adopt the latest national science education standards published in 2013. In 2019, over a dozen bills were proposed in state legislatures across the U.S. that were designed to alter science education standards in schools. So what, what is the nature of, of this organization and, and why was it founded? The National Center for Science Education was founded back in the 80s when there was a pretty concerted movement across the country to have creationism taught in public schools instead of or along with evolution. And a lot of scientists and science teachers and s concerned citizens felt that that wasn't appropriate, that what should be taught in science classes, um, what scientists understand to be the best ex explanation of how the world works. Is there not a, a national standard for science instruction in this country? No. State is run, education is managed at the state level. So each state has a set of science standards. And those science standards are then implemented in all of the school districts in that state. So they can differ a great deal. There are 50 states with 50 sets of science standards and- That's shocking, by the way. 
<laughs> that they're different. Yeah. It is such a core part of being American, though, that education is controlled locally. That that is um, that goes back to the founding of the country. That that every community would educate its own children. In Ohio, a bill recently passed the House, which some say, if signed into law, could allow students to get answers on scientist tests wrong if they claim a religious objection. And a new Alabama law requires biology books to include a statement denying evolution is a scientific fact. Why do we see dinosaurs here, out on, essentially, on the main street here? Uh, you know, I'm not necessarily a big fan of dinosaurs, but I think dinosaurs are a powerful tool, and they've been used by people who believe in evolution to make people believe that the Earth is millions and millions of years old. Randall Gabriel runs a successful oil and gas company on the outskirts of town. I think the better evidence is that um, dinosaurs did coexist with humans and roamed the Earth 5,000 years ago. I think there's better evidence for that. And, and this is based on a timeline that's supported by the Bible? A timeline that is supported by the Bible. I mean, it's a little surprising because, uh, at least where I come from, and maybe it's different yeah. here, but, you know, if you go to public school, uh, you learn that dinosaurs existed 65 million right. years ago. Absolutely. So, yes. so is, is this taught in schools here? If this, this is taught in the Christian Academy. Since the 1960s, the Supreme Court has upheld that teaching creationism is unconstitutional. But this doesn't apply to private schools, like the Woodward Christian Academy, where Gabriel is the principal and science teacher. And this is kindergarten and first grade. And then we start combining classes. This is a science room. So we got the days of creation on the floor. Well, it goes from, in the beginning, God separated the, the dark from the light, and the light from the dark, to um, waters above, waters below, created dry land on the third day. The fourth day, he created the sun, the moon, the stars, the comets, and that was actually the fourth day. Fifth day, he created the fishes of the, of the sea and the, the birds of the air. And then on the sixth day, he created humans, all the land animals, which we believe includes the dinosaurs. And on the seventh day over there, he rested, so we put a nice old beach in uh, the ocean for a day of rest. Can you walk me through a little bit about what differentiates a uh, Christian Academy from, let's say, a, you know, a, a secular public school in terms of instruction? Uh, well, we have more freedom for sure, and, um, and, and a little bit more control. And so we, as far as instructions are, it's going to be biblical based. It seems like f in your mind, science, scientific law flows from the Bible. The Bible describes the world we live in. Evolution describes a world we don't live in, okay? If evolution was true, Star Wars, you know, you watch Star Wars and all these crazy animals, mm -hmm. you know, everywhere you go, you got these different creatures. Yeah. That's evolution would be true. That's not the world we live in, okay? If evolution was true, I would say, hey, daughter, why don't you go out and get some dirt and shake it around and new life was, was, was spring up. That's not the world we live in. It's not the world we live in. Right. It is, the Bible describes the world we live in. But we're not seriously using Star Wars as an example to disprove or prove evolution, are we? The, the, yes, seriously. Because, you are. Because the creatures on Star Wars, Jabba the Hutt, all these animals that talk, all these strange things, I think if evolution was true, that's the world we would see. Okay. Yes, it is true that probably 97, 98% of all scientists say you can take dirt and you can get amoebas and you can get humans. The process of evolution. Mm -hmm. Yet every single laboratory that experiments with that knows that's a lie. What's the, what, why lie? What's the, uh, why, what's why are they saying that? Because they, they, they have to have life coming from lifeless matter, even though they, it doesn't, because if they have, if they don't, then where did the original life come from? Their agenda is they don't want to believe in God, and so they're 
they're promoting an agenda without God. We're going to do an experiment, and I have to use fire because I want you all to think about cause and effect. Many alternative teachings like Gabriel's equate faith-based concepts to scientific tenets. Can you repeat that? How problematic is it when we talk about evolution, it's not the law of evolution. It's just, it's a theory. It's just a theory. Does that create an opening for, for doubt? Uh, it absolutely does, because theory is a, a word that's used very, very differently in day-to-day -day life than it is in science. In science, a theory is a big deal, a way of thinking about um, a, a natural phenomenon for it to reach the level of being called a theory means that it's been confirmed by a whole series of kinds of evidence and that it's a useful way of understanding a, a whole part of how the world works. So, you know, we have cell theory to describe how multi-celled organisms are organized, and nobody seems to doubt that just because it's called a theory. Um, but in the case of evolution, for people who are looking for a, a reason to reject it, so... So the colloquial use of the word theory is not applicable in science. Exactly. Geographic location isn't the only factor impacting curriculums. Textbooks also play a pivotal role, and states with a large student population, like Texas, can influence textbook content in other states. Truth in Textbooks is a grassroots organization made up of volunteers who are concerned about one thing, and that is returning truth to the textbooks of K through 12 students uh, in public schools. Uh, and some private schools use these textbooks too. Truth in Textbooks has lobbied for things like portraying Islam as fundamentally violent, and White runs an anti-Muslim group based in San Antonio. So the Truth in Textbook started off here in Texas, right. has gone nationwide. Any sense as to how many texts are being reviewed in any given year? Yeah, uh, well we did 32 here in Texas, and, and oh by the way, five million kids in the state of Texas have more accurate textbooks because of what, 50 volunteers. This was only done by 50 volunteers. It wasn't done by a lot. That's not bad to have on your headstone that you were able to impact that. Well, in California, we did 28 textbooks out there. In Florida, we've probably done close to 15 or 20. Truth in Textbooks primarily focuses on history, but White says they will start reviewing science textbooks as well. What are some of the challenges that you're mounting vis-a-vis -vis climate science? We saw this showing up in the social studies textbooks in geography for example, where they would talk about topography and weather and other types of things. And we found there was a real common theme when it got to talking about climate, is that the questions were leading the students to the conclusion that fossil fuels are always bad, and that they are the cause, solely the cause, or the primary cause for what is considered climate change. And we never saw an opportunity of that teaching moment in the classroom to say, how about there's some other explanations for that? Let's present both sides of the argument. So on its face, the idea of teaching both sides seems totally fair and equitable. What's wrong with that? Right? It does. And so does academic freedom. Who's, who's against that? The problem is when it's set up as both sides, as if there are two scientific sides, when there aren't. That, that climate change and human responsibility for climate change is supported by vast amounts of evidence. It's the, it's the consensus of the scientific community. Not climate change is not supported by any evidence at all. So saying we want to teach both sides, we want to teach the side that's supported by science and the side that's not supported by science in a science classroom just doesn't make any sense. How does the internet and YouTube impact science education in schools? It's a big issue that goes way beyond science education, as, as you know. But science education is perhaps one of the best tools we have to help students resist that kind of misinformation. Similarly, if students go out and f look at sources online, and this is another thing that teachers can do, go out, find information online, bring it in, and we're all going to talk about where you got that information. Half of surveyed YouTube viewers in 2018 said they use the platform for educational purposes. And a 2019 report found that 56% of kids aged 8 through 12 and 69% aged 13 to 18 watch online videos every day. Hey guys, you need your papers from yesterday? 
and a pencil. So how can I identify misleading information? Melissa Lau was trained by the National Center for Science Education on how to teach in an area that's not always welcome to its tenants. We're looking at fake experts today. Over the next few days, we're going to be looking at logical fallacies, cherry picking. That means picking out just certain little pieces of the information that help you and not considering all of the information together. And conspiracy theories. I know you guys know what a conspiracy theory is. You guys watch enough YouTube to know what that stuff is. It's, it's right. shocking that so at a sixth like grade level, so we're talk, to kids are like having that. to learn how um, to decipher misinformation that they can get from the internet from around the world. Power, different ways that Being a student will, today um, in the uh, age of the internet like is such a minefield. Man, you guys asked me some hard questions today. You guys asked me some hard questions today. Thank you. Melissa? Um, when you were talking about misinformation and fake experts yeah. in a classroom for sixth graders, yeah. it's been a while since I've been in a classroom. Right. But it's shocking that kids are having to navigate that kind of a world. Right. Um, and I think for me, that's the thing that's. To me, that's what I need to do for them. It's more not so much just the science, but it is how to navigate this world that's changing in that way because yeah. they have this skill to be able to find when somebody's misleading them with like a political ad yeah. or if somebody is misleading them with, you know, any kind of, you know, yeah. pseudoscience, you know, anti-vax or flat earth or anything like that that's, that's going around right now. Yeah. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a survival skill in this day and age. So how, how are you enjoying the uh, conference so far? Loving it. It's, it's awesome. actually her birthday present, just what she wanted to do for her birthday. You wanted to come? Yeah. How did you first learn about Flat Earth? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm homeschooling her. So she had questions and mm -hmm. she she had better questions than I did because she has, you know, she wasn't in school. She was never indoctrinated. So yeah. she brought up things that I was already had this thought of, you know, what it was, a globe, and what right. they told us, but she didn't. So she was able to bring things to the table yeah. that I had not thought of. Yeah, and it's the truth. It's, it's the, the truth. truth. And, yeah. and it sets yeah. you free. What's the end game here? What is your goal? World domination? Besides that. <laughs> no, um, critical mass. What has happened is we have been skewing younger and younger. I've been introduced to more families over the last 12 months than I have in the, the previous three years. Once the kids start talking about it, but if you can get it, it's like, oh, well, you're into flat earth, you're into flat yeah. earth. You know, it's one thing, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing. It's oh. one thing for you or I to be talking about this, or for people, you know, their 20s, 30s, 40s, what have you. Yeah. But when you start getting into schools, do you think flat earth should be taught in schools? And, and is this something that you may, you realistically see? in the future. Yes, I do. I think that eventually, because we're skewing younger and younger, I think it will be taught in schools. What are the stakes here? I mean, you know, we're all free to believe what we want. And even if the Flat Earth community, you know, doubled, tripled, quadrupled in size, is it really any of our business? And the thing is, our society relies on a division of cognitive labor. We outsource a lot of that um, knowledge and that skill. I have no idea how to change the oil in my car. So I take my car to a mechanic and I trust that the mechanic is going to do that. And without that, if we can't rely on one another and trust completely breaks down, then we are sort of scared and, and nervous and responsible for everything on our own. And, and that's just not sustainable as a society.
Hey, thanks for checking out CBS and Originals on YouTube. If you want to watch more documentaries, download the free CBS News app on your phone, tablet, smart TV, or any streaming device. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking down here. Thanks for watching.